All right, so let's continue working on some more Lewis structures here. Uh, our next example is SF6. So again, we need to find out the central atom. Central atom is written first, and so we'd have our sulfur surrounded by six fluorines. So I'm just going to draw it with each of those fluorines bounded to our sulfur. And so then we now need to figure out how many valence electrons we, we have. Well, sulfur has six, and then each of our fluorines give us seven based upon the number of valence electrons that we'd have. So we'd have a total of 48 electrons. So we can go ahead now and fill in our electrons to give all of our outside atoms octets. And so we give all of our fluorines an octet. And we notice here that with that we've used 8, 16, 24, 32, 40, 48 electrons. So we've used all of our electrons. Now one thing we notice about this molecule is that all the fluorines have an octet, but then if we notice our sulfur, we would see, well, how many electrons does it have in its valence shell? We would notice that we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So we see sulfur has 12 electrons in its valence shell. What we would say, usually things want to have 8 electrons, to have an octet, to have eight electrons in the valence shell. What we see here is that sulfur has what we call an expanded octet. And an expanded octet is where the valence shell has more than eight electrons. Now one thing that we have to know here is that this can only happen if the electrons in the valence shell can expand into the d orbital. Okay, so for example, if we have eight electrons, uh, for example, in the n equals three shell, well, n equals three means we can have three s, three p, and three d. Well, our three s is gonna hold two of those electrons. Our three p is gonna hold six of those electrons. And so now if we have 12 electrons, we need to be able to expand into the D and have electrons in our D orbital. And so now if we have not eight, but we have 12 electrons, that means we're gonna have four electrons in our D orbital. And so it's important to note that we must have D orbitals in the valence shell to be able to expand. Well, if we look at the allowable values for our uh, L values, which tells us our, or the quantum number of L, which tells us uh, what subshells we can have, we know this is only going to happen in the third period and below. And if we go to our periodic table, we would notice that uh, our, our sulfur is in the third period. So it has the ability to expand in um, it's octet. So for example, if instead of having sulfur, we have what's right above it in the group, O, OF6 cannot exist. And that's because oxygen cannot expand its octet. Okay, so one thing we note here uh, is that everything has its octet in SF6. But when we do that, that gives sulfur 12 electrons, and that only can happen if the sulfur, that central atom, can expand its octet, can expand into the d orbitals, and this only happens in the third period or below. Okay, so that's our FF6. Move on to our next example, PF3. So PF3, we would have our phosphorus surrounded by our three fluorines, and to find the total number of valence electrons that we would have, We'd have five for phosphorus and another uh, three times seven for fluorine. And so we're going to have 26 electrons. So we give all of our terminal atoms, the ones on the outside, an octet. Once we've done that, let's count our electrons. We have eight, 
counting these lone pairs and our bond. For that uh, fluorine, we have another eight, we have another eight, so we've used 24 electrons. And so that means if we want to get to 26, we have two more. We can give those on our central atom. And now we can go and see, does everything have an octet? Yes, all of our atoms, whether they are the fluorines, which has two, four, six, eight electrons, or our phosphorus, which has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. So they all have an octet and they are all stable and happy in that. So then now we can go ahead and look at, well, what happens if we have an ion? So now have NH4, so we have nitrogen surrounded by hydrogen. And to find out how many electrons we have, we're gonna have five for nitrogen. Each one of our hydrogens gives us one electron. Now we notice this plus one charge. What that plus one tells us is that we have one less electron than accounted for the valence electrons. And so what that means is total, we would actually have one less electron than our five plus four. We'd have one less, so we'd have a total of eight electrons, not nine. And that's what that plus one tells us. The plus one tells us we would take away one of those electrons for our overall molecule. And then to show that this Lewis structure has a plus one charge, we put brackets around it and we say plus one to tell us that that's a plus one. So now we have eight electrons and let's count our electrons. We have two, four, six, eight. And we note here, nitrogen has an octet. It's got eight electrons. And one thing to note about our hydrogen, since our hydrogen only has the one S, it only needs two electrons to be stable. Okay, so now we see that we can identify what the number of electrons that we would have based upon hydrogen is only two. And now we have our stable molecule here of NH4 plus uh, that we've drawn out all of the bonds there. Okay, so each of these are thinking through uh, our structures that we would have based upon the number of electrons and what our central atom is. So now the next ones that we want to think through is using this idea we would call resonance and Lewis structures and formal charge. Okay, so our next example here is CNO minus. Okay, so we look at C, N, and O, and we notice that carbon is furthest left in the periodic table. They're all on the same period. And so that would tell us that carbon is the least electronegative atom. And what that tells us is carbon is going to be our central atom. And so that would mean we'd have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. <clears throat> and so here we have, let's find out how many electrons we have. We have four for carbon, five for nitrogen, six for oxygen. And then now since we have this negative one charge, we now add one electron because now we have extra electrons relative to what we would have for just carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And so now we have a total of 16 electrons. Okay, so now we go to our atom here. Let's go ahead and put our brackets around here to say we have a negative one charge. And let's give all of our terminal atoms an octet. And now we've noticed that we've used all 16 of our electrons. Now, unlike our CO2, that we, the example we did previously, here what we notice is that one side of the molecule we have oxygen, the other side of the molecule we have nitrogen. So maybe we're gonna see this might affect how we think through the bonding that they would have. This is where we're gonna apply the idea of formal charge, okay? Formal charge is defined as on that handout that I have given you, formal charge tells us something about the uh, number of electrons that an atom wants to have around it versus how many it has. Okay, so formal charge is going to be equal to uh, what our effective nuclear charge is minus the number of electrons that quote unquote belong to that specific atom. Okay, and so what we would see here is that that would be equal to the number of bonds, okay, because we think of one electron being given to each atom in the number of, uh, for each bond, plus the number of lone pair electrons. 
that are on that specific atom. Okay. And as it was outlined in the handout, we want our formal charge to be as close to zero as possible. And we'll see if it can't be zero, we're going to identify which um, atom does the formal charge want to sit on. So now what we see here is that there's basically three different possibilities that we can have for our structure. Because we notice here, our carbon does not have an octet, nor do we have any more electrons to give it. We've used all eight, 16 of our electrons. So there's three different ways that we can give our carbon octet. Okay, Way number one would be where we have oxygen double bonded to carbon and nitrogen also double bonded to carbon. Okay, and so now this gives carbon an octet. But we also can have option number two, oxygen triple bonded to carbon and then nitrogen single bonded to carbon. And this also gives an octet. Or we can have option number three, oxygen double bonded to, or sorry, not double bonded to carbon, we already did that one. Oxygen single bonded to carbon and then nitrogen. Triple bonded to carbon. Each of these are valid Lewis structures. Right? They all give an octet for every single element. Okay, so we see every atom has an octet. They're all happy. The thing that comes into play now is we want to think, what well, is the formal charge equal to zero or close to equal to zero as possible for each of these? So let's calculate the formal charge. Uh, I'm going to explicitly show it for each of our atoms in our first one. And number two and three, I'm going to fill it in. So the formal charge of oxygen is going to be equal to its effective nuclear charge, six, minus the number of bonds that it has. So we note here there's two bonds, plus there's four lone pair electrons, these four electrons. And so that would give it effective nuclear charge of zero. Okay, we're on the right track. Formal charge of carbon is going to be its effective nuclear charge minus four bonds and zero lone pairs. Zero. Okay, we're still on the right track. And then the formal charge of nitrogen is going to be equal to five. That's its effective nuclear charge minus it's got two bonds and four lone pair electrons, negative one. So we see we have negative one for our formal charge, the way we, dic we write that is we go ahead and put a circle next to that nitrogen. Now that does not mean that nitrogen has a negative one charge. What it tells us is it has too many electrons relative to what its effective nuclear charge is. So then we can go ahead and do the same thing that we would see for each one of those, okay? So I'm just gonna write zero if it's zero to show that it's zero. So it's zero for carbon. Nitrogen's gonna be negative two and oxygen is going to be plus one, if we were to calculate each of those. We'll do the same thing for uh, our fourth one. So oxygen, excuse me, our third one would be, our carbon would be zero, nitrogen would be zero, and oxygen would be negative one. So right off the bat, we can see we want as many of them to have a formal charge of zero as possible. That would tell us our second one is gonna be the worst description of our molecule. It does not describe what our molecule is well. Okay, and so then therefore, uh, we would not choose that as our, our, as our Lewis structure. And so now what we would do is, okay, well now let's compare between number three and number one. Well, both of them have a negative one formal charge. Well, how do we decide which one's, which one's best? If we see something like that, we're gonna choose where the negative formal charge sits on the most electronegative atom. Because that electronegative atom, that means that that atom wants electrons. And so what we would do is we can compare nitrogen versus oxygen. Well, what we would see here, the electronegativity of oxygen is greater than the electronegativity of nitrogen. Now what that tells me is that my formal charge is gonna to wanna to sit that negative formal charge on my oxygen and not on the nitrogen. And so that would tell me this would be the best description of our actual molecule. And so our actual Lewis structure would be oxygen, carbon, triple bonded to nitrogen, 
and then our oxygen has three lone pairs on it, and then the overall charge would be negative one, and we can go ahead and keep that formal charge on there of oxygen of negative one. And so this would be our actual Lewis structure. So we identified three possible Lewis structures. We identified the worst based upon the fact that two different atoms have formal charges, and one of them also has a negative two. We don't want to be too far off from zero. And then we compared number one and number three. Number three had the formal charge sitting on the most electronegative atom, which is what we saw here. Okay, so this is applying this idea of formal charge. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and take a break, and we're going to start another video where we're going to explain uh, looking at resonance structures as formal charge with IO3 minus.